Hey guys, and welcome back to the Ether Hub. I'm Simon bringing you another Magic the Gathering video. Today we'll be looking at a character from the early days of MTG lore who just got a brand new card in Commander Legends. Funnily enough, this character is probably one of the most important in terms of ushering in what we would call the modern day of MTG storytelling. She has died several times, but somehow always seems to bounce back. She's a feared assassin responsible for the deaths of some of the biggest names in MTG history. And while she's certainly had her fair share of printing some cards, before, her Commander Legend card is the very first time we get to see her as a true planeswalker. Let's take a closer look at Jessica Thrice Reborn, her importance in the MTG universe, and just exactly how she's been resurrected three times now. Remember, if you enjoy the channel and our content, don't forget to like, subscribe, and tick that notification bell. You can also check out our Patreon page linked in the description below. And now, back to the lore. Jessica Thrice Reborn is a unique planeswalker with zero base loyalty for two generic and one red mana. Jessica Thrice Reborn enters the battlefield with a loyalty counter on it for each time you cast a commander from your command zone this game. Her plus zero ability, choose target creature until your next turn. If that creature would deal combat damage to one of your opponents, it deals triple that damage to that player instead. Minus X, Jessica Thrice Reborn deals X damage to each of up to three targets. And that's it, there's no ultimate ability on this planeswalker, but as it's a planeswalker in Commander Legends, it of course can be your commander as well. And she's also a planeswalker with partner. And yeah, that's always a fun ability to try and wrap your head around. As I said in the opener, Jiska is a character from deep in MTG's history, one of the first major characters in the story who's been through a hell of a lot over the years. She also happens to be directly responsible for one of the most impactful events to ever happen, not only to the MTG multiverse, but to the real game. Like our actual card game was forever altered thanks to Jessica. But we'll get into all that later. First, let's start with her origins and just how she found herself resurrected for the very first time. Jessica was born a human on the plane of Dominaria, the massive center of all of MTG's great older stories. She grew up in an isolated tribe with her brother Kamal, learning ancient secrets from nearby dwarven clans, which sort of made her an outcast to her own people, who feared she identified more with her dwarven friends than her own tribe. With that troubled early start, Jessica and Kamal went out to strike it big in Cabal City. Kamal was a strong warrior and berserker, so dueling in the fighting pits became very lucrative for him. But Kamal found more than riches in Cabal City. He also found the Mirari. The Mirari is an artifact of great intrigue in MTG's history. It's a device of unknown origins that grants its wielder whatever they most desire. Anything can be within their grasp, but at a cost. It's much like the idea of a monkey's paw or a dark genie. Yeah, it'll grant wishes, but their outcomes won't always be what the wielder wants. Their desires will be twisted, often to the detriment of the one who makes the wish. So anyone who's ever used a Mirari, well, they find out pretty quickly that power comes at a great cost. And Kamal learned this lesson in a very personal way. After gaining control of the Mirari, Kamal knew of its dark power but believed his strength could control it. Even when fighting back against his strongest desires, Kamal still ended up fashioning the Mirari into a pommel for his sword, looking to use its power to unite the warring barbarian clans under his banner. A sacrilegious betrayal of their code of conduct, something his sister Jessica strongly protested. But, as the Mirari tends to do, Kamal was blinded by his own desires and wouldn't let even his beloved sister stand in his way. So, with the Mirari deeply entrenched in his mind, Kamal drew a mortal blow against Jessica, wounding her with a creeping infection that would soon bring her death. And seeing what he had done, Kamal snapped out of his berserker stance and saw aid for his dying sister. He cast the Mirari aside, something that took real personal strength, and brought Jessica to a healer. However, enemies at this time were looking for any advantage they could get their hands on, anything that could secure them power and influence over Dominaria, and none were more persistent than a Cabal. The dark underbelly of Dominaria teeming with cultists and thugs would turn over any stone to gain control over the Marari, granting it to their dear leader, the Cabal Patriarch, and this included the capture of a mortally wounded woman. Yes, the Cabal captured the dying Jessica, looking to use her against her brother, but first, they needed her to survive to act as bait, or at least die in a proper way at the proper time. While the Patriarch did look to kill Jessica, fate had other, even darker plans for her. While the Patriarch used his killing touch on Jessica, she didn't die, but rather she transformed. 
No one knew that Jessica had a latent planeswalker spark, a tremendous power waiting to be unleashed. This was a time before the mending, so planeswalkers were like gods. And with the patriarch trying to kill her, Jessica's planeswalker spark didn't quite ignite, but more so expanded over her, taking in that death magic of the patriarch and infusing Jessica with it instead of actually killing her. Thus was born a new being by the name of Phage the Untouchable. Because of the nature of Jessica's death and Phage's birth, she was unable to touch organic material. The death magic that created her was now part of her very biology, causing her touch to rot and decay almost anything. This unplanned ritual also caused Phage to be devoutly loyal to the Cabal Patriarch, who now had a new weapon in his schemes for domination. And this, the birth of Phage, was the first resurrection of Jessica. Jessica, now going by her new name Phage, would have a lot more to her story during this unique villainous stage of her life. Being the death-wielding tool of the Cabal, I guess, wouldn't have much of an upside. To make matters worse, whenever she assassinated someone, and believe me, she killed a ton of high-profile targets, she would spawn essentially a magical worm inside of herself. I know, old school magic, right? It was always out there in terms of the story, but even this is kind of ridiculous. These death worms, as they're called, were really powerful, almost spiritual fragments of the soul she took. So powerful, in fact, that Kamal mentioned that if let loose upon the world, these death worms could destroy all of Dominaria. At one point, while attempting to free Jessica from this fate of being phage, they managed to extract a worm, returning her briefly back to the original Jessica. However, this was short-lived because those death worms, they were really running amok, and they were only ever truly contained when inside Phage. So Jessica made the heart-wrenching decision to return to Phage, and with no real other alternative, Kamal set forth to free his sister through the only means he had left, a clean death. While Kamal was out looking to end the suffering of his sister, another being was also looking for vengeance on Phage. The angelic illusion, Akroma. Akroma has her own unique origin story, but in essence, she's not a real angel, but rather an illusion made physical by the ultra-powerful wizard Ixidor. Ixidor was wronged by the Cabal, who killed his wife and threw him to the desert to die. So, he crafted Akroma to be his own vengeance against them, but more specifically, against Phage, who was the one that actually killed his wife. Yeah, loads of conflicting parties, betrayal, vengeance sinking, everything you'd expect from good old-fashioned old-school magic. But what came next is just pure insanity as a Chroma, Phage, Kamal, and a third lesser known party, Zagorka, meet for a final confrontation. Kamal was ready and willing to end his sister, at least what his sister had become, but didn't know these other two ladies who seemed to join the fight. Zagorka honestly was just in the wrong place at the wrong time here, but Akroma and Phage were going at it for real. Kamal saw his shot and took it, swinging an arcing cleave, and in a single blow killing Phage, Akroma, and accidentally, Zagorka all at once. Now, all three of these women had unique magical properties to them. Akroma was an illusionary angel made of pure magic, Phage was a resurrected death mage with a latent planeswalker spark, and Zagorka, well, I don't actually know. She's tied to some, like, ancient religion, but she didn't really know it? Something like that. She was special, and for writing purposes, she was needed for what was coming next. The second resurrection of Jessica, and the birth of Corona. The essence of these three women coalesced into a single being, a deity of magic, a goddess on Dominaria, Corona. Corona, from what we know, is a being that had always existed in Dominaria's past, an avatar of all the magic on the plane that had faded from history for an unknown reason. Somehow, with these three powerful magical entities and the manner in which they died, they came together to create a new Corona who came to be known as the False God. Now, being the goddess of magic, you'd think this would be an awesome upgrade for Jessica slash Phage, right? And in terms of power, it certainly was. However, being able to peer into the very existence of life and answer questions mortals couldn't even begin to ask, well, that starts to fray your edges just a bit. At this point, there was nothing left of the old Jessica. Corona was something completely different, an out-of-touch deity who didn't know how and couldn't even care to try to understand human emotion. She has some massive Dr. Manhattan energy going Going on. Still, Corona went on her own journey in an attempt to understand her purpose, meeting with other godlike figures throughout the multiverse to gain new perspectives. Sadly, the takeaway from that mostly came from a meeting with Yagmoth, yes, the god of the Phyrexians. He tainted Corona's thinking, and the goddess returned to Dominaria looking to kill any other god and assume all power there, because, of course. 
Starting a war with an entire plane, planning on killing everyone's cherished gods, that's going to give you a lot of enemies. Corona was eventually killed by those closest to the goddess. She was betrayed. But in her death, Corona again split back into the three women who created her. And while Zagorka and Akroma were actually dead, Jessica's latent planeswalker spark finally ignited from the experience, saving her life, restoring her to her original form, and giving her the untapped magical powers that came with being an old school planeswalker. Her story from here on revolved around her learning just how to be a planeswalker from Karn, which of course was really fun to see. So with that, let's count it. This is the third resurrection of Jessica coming full circle from barbarian to resurrected zombie slave to a goddess and back into a mortal planeswalker. Quite the journey indeed. Now, at the beginning of this video, I said that Jessica was probably the most important character in terms of how we see modern MTG storytelling and even the game itself. And that's because of her actions during the Rift Crisis on Dominaria. Because of all the massive magical events that took place on this plane over the years, the fabric of reality was starting to fall apart, and these warping rifts began to consume the sky. These threatened not only Dominaria, but the fabric of the multiverse itself. Here we see tons of heroes and even villains like Nicol Bolas sacrificing a lot in order to close these rifts. But it was Jessica, now a planeswalker, who ultimately proved the most valuable. As she sets to close the rift that formed with the birth and death of Corona, her own previous form, Jessica released her untold powers as a planeswalker across the whole of Dominaria, closing not only that, but all of the final rifts still open. With the rifts closed, a shockwave pulsed throughout the multiverse as the Great Mending occurred. The Great Mending was this natural phenomenon that saw the limits of magical beings finally set. While in the past, planeswalkers wielded godlike powers and could even create worlds themselves, it was that abuse of magic that brought the multiverse to this very point. So the Great Mending was a natural cure to that, limiting how much any being could tap into at any given time, giving us the more tempered and human planeswalkers we see today. Yes, planeswalkers control great power, with far more unique spells than the average mage, but never again could they be what they were before. This is how we see modern day planeswalkers, and the Great Mending was the start of our own modern era of MTG storytelling. So yeah, Jessica was responsible for ushering that in, although some players will still say that even these modern planeswalkers can still be considered gods in their own formats, think Jace and Tefiri, there's no doubt that these would be even more oppressive in standard if they had the powers of a pre-mending planeswalker. Anyway guys, that's going to do it for this video on the life, history, and design of Jessica Thrice Reborn, and just exactly how she was resurrected three times in MTG's history. Now I want you to let me know in the comments how you plan to use this card in a commander deck. Of course, if you enjoyed the video, make sure you show your support by leaving a like, subscribing, and taking that notification bell. You can also check out all the great perks you can get by supporting us over on Patreon. Find that link in the description below. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and until next time... See ya!